See, many a times we come across statements which involve the if then phrase. For example, if it rains, then the atmospheric humidity will increase. So, this statement is trying to say that under the condition of raining, the outcome of rise in the atmospheric humidity will take place. This is the reason why such statements involving the if-then phrase are called conditional statements. If you dig a bit deeper into the given statement, you'll realize that this is actually a compound statement having P and Q to be its two respective component statements or sub-statements. In here, P is the simple statement which is it rains and Q is the simple statement which is the atmospheric humidity increases. So in the compact form, I can write this as if P, then Q. Agreed? Yes. So it's like these two simple statements P and Q are combining together, connecting together with the help of the phrase if then and hence giving rise to this if then implication which is denoted by P implies Q. Okay. In here P is called the antecedent. And Q is called the consequent. Alright. Our aim is to understand how the truth value of a conditional statement is impacted by the truth value of its respective component statements. Alright. So, in here I have an example for you. It says, if Sonu goes to school, then Monu goes to school. You can clearly catch hold of the fact that this is a compound statement formed with the help of the phrase if then. In fact, its two component statements or sub-statements are Sonu goes to school, let's call it P. Monu goes to school, let's call it Q. Obviously, P and Q are combining together with the help of the phrase if then and hence giving rise to this if-then implication, which is denoted by P implies Q. Okay, in here, this is the antecedent and this is the consequent. Okay, I have this table with first two columns representing the simple statements which are the component statements of this given compound statement okay we have p and q and the last column comprises of the conditional statement p implies q all right what is our agenda to find out how the truth value of the conditional statement are impacted by the truth value of its sub statements so the first scenario can be when p is true and q is also true the second scenario can be when P is true but Q is false. The third scenario can be when P is false but Q is true. And the fourth scenario can be when P is false and Q is also false. These are the only four cases wherein we can have the combinations of the truth values of P and Q. In each of these cases, I have to conclude about the truth value of the conditional statement P implies Q. So let's get started. For that, what you need to do is interpret the language of the given statement very, very carefully and very, very closely and very, very thoroughly. It's saying, if Sonu goes to school, then Monu will go to school. So there is a pact, there is a deal between Sonu and Monu that if Sonu goes, then Monu will definitely go. So this deal should not get violated, that should be in the mind. Okay, so let's talk about the first scenario. Sonu goes to school, Monu goes to school. Right? Both P and Q are happening to be valid statements. That means they are happening to be true statements. That means they are holding true. So, Sonu is going to school, Monu is going to school. This is not violating the deal between them. Right? That means the outcome certainly is holding valid and hence it's true. Moving on to the second scenario. Sonu goes to school, Monu does not go to school. 
right? P is holding true, Q is holding false. That means P is holding valid, Q is holding invalid. That means what? Sonu is going to school, Monu is not going to school. Wait a second, what was the deal? If Sonu goes, Monu will pakka go, Monu will definitely go. But right now what's happening? Sonu is going, but Monu is not going. That means this is violating the pact, the deal between them and hence the outcome was invalid or false. Moving on to the third scenario. It says, Sonu does not go to school, Monu goes to school. Okay. And fourth scenario is saying, Sonu does not go to school, Monu does not go to school. Now here is the catch guys. The statement is saying, if Sonu goes, then Monu will definitely go. But it is nowhere saying that if Sonu doesn't go, then what will Monu do? Right. So understand, the statement is saying that if Sonu goes, then Monu will definitely go. But if Sonu doesn't go, then Monu may or may not go. Okay, so the third scenario is saying that if Sonu doesn't go, Monu is going. That's fine, cool, he may go. And fourth scenario is saying if Sonu doesn't go, then Monu also doesn't go. Fine, that can also happen. The deal will get violated when, when Sonu goes but Monu doesn't go. Right, which is happening in the second scenario. But if Sonu goes, or I should say if Sonu doesn't go, even then Monu goes or doesn't go. That's on Monu. It is not violating the deal at all. That means in any other scenario, you are always getting a valid outcome. Okay? So what is the conclusion that we can infer from here, we can draw from here? That conditional statement, P implies Q, is holding false only when the antecedent is true but consequent is false. In any other scenario, the conditional statement will always hold to be valid. It will always hold to be true. Understood? Now see, there are multiple ways of addressing the if-then implication. Let's take the help of an example. It says that if a number is a multiple of 9, then it is a multiple of 3. Of course, this is a compound statement formed with two component statements. A number is a multiple of 9. Let's call it P. And the number is a multiple of 3, let's call it Q. Obviously, P and Q, which are two simple statements, are joining together with the help of the phrase if-then and hence giving rise to this if-then implication statement written over here, which in the compact form you write as P implies Q. Right. So, one way of reading this is P implies Q, that is if P, then Q. Interpretation of this is if P holds then Q holds. Alternatively, I can say Q holds if P holds. That means Q if P. Or I can say that a number is a multiple of 9 only if it is a multiple of 3. That also means the same thing. What does this give you? A number is a multiple of 9 only if it is a multiple of 3. So another way of writing this statement is P only if Q. Also realize, what is the statement saying? If a number is a multiple of 9, then it's a multiple of 3. Try to think. Use your common sense. If I know that a number is a multiple of 9, it is sufficient for me to definitely conclude that it will be a multiple of 3. That means P is a sufficient condition for Q. Okay? Alternatively, if a number is a multiple of 9, it will necessarily be a multiple of 3. That means Q is a necessary condition for P. So please keep in mind guys, these are alternate versions of representing the exact same statement. P implies Q, that is if P then Q, is same as Q if P, is same as P only if Q is same as P is sufficient for Q is same as Q is necessary for P. So I guess the if-then implication is extremely clear to you. 